Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome back as we continue to work our way through this book of James on Sunday night. We're uh, kind of headed towards the end of it now in the fifth chapter. We're looking at the 10th through the 12th verses tonight. If you are a study sheet person, that's study sheet number 29. And pretty much we're just going to focus in on this, the first two verses here, the, the 10th and the 11th verses. But before we get started, let's, um, let's ask the Lord, as we should always do, to ask Him for His blessing, because He is the one who illuminates us and makes these not just words on a page, uh, applies it to our hearts. So let's ask Him for that special illumination as we study His Word together. Pray with me. Our dear Lord, as we, uh, as we once again uh, turn to this book of James, and we've made our way slowly through each one of the chapters. We're coming to um, sort of the culmination, not quite yet. But uh, we pray that as we wrap up these, this last chapter, that you will bless each and every word that we study, each and every verse. And this evening, as we continue in one vein, uh, a discussion that he's been having, that of suffering and persecution and how we hold up under that suffering and persecution, and then um, perhaps turning our attention towards um, um, the, uh, uh, the need not to be turning on each other and the truthfulness that is necessary in all of our relationships. We again just ask for your, your illumination that we, would, um, that we would be edified, that we would grow, um, but that our thoughts and our hearts and our, our study and our interest in the word that we're going to be studying would be pleasing to you and that it would bring glory to you, that uh, uh, it even, even in something as simple as studying the Bible, that you would be glorified. Uh, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, we are indeed uh, looking at the fifth chapter of James here, and let me kind of sort of bring you up to the tenth verse of, of sort of where we were at the very end of it. If you remember, James is, is, is trying to teach his people to, to be patient under the, the, the kind of persecution that they're going under. Now, he started out talking about the unrighteous rich and how they were persecuting the people and how he desperately did not want that to to make its way into the church. Um, but then he sort of turns to uh, how not to react, uh, to remember that vengeance is the Lord and, and, and that God is the one who puts all authority in place. Now, not everyone who was persecuting the church had authority over them. It might have just been people who were swindling them or people who were causing them to lose their jobs or, or, or whatever. There were so many different ways that the early church was being persecuted. Um, and so we don't know that all of them were placed in authority. But um, God wants Christians, the church, to, to be separate from the world and therefore to act in a different way than the world does. And that's one of the things that James is trying to bring home to us as we get towards the end of this. So why don't we take a look at, um, at these uh, verses and read them, and then I'll sort of remind you of what we've already looked at, where James is, and then we'll go and uh, continue the study of the 10th and the 11th verses this evening. So let's read them together first. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And then it's almost like James loses his train of thought. <laughs> he seems to switch to a completely different thought altogether. We'll address this when we get to it later. Look at the 12th verse. But above all, brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Um, very interesting the way he has juxtap juxtaposed, is that the way you say it? Um, these different uh, thoughts with each other. In fact, we've been noticing that as we've made our way throughout this entire book. So, 
Let's go back to that 10th verse and just remind ourselves of where we are. Just before this, one of the things that James was telling his readers was not to grumble. Don't, don't grumble, and particularly, he says, and don't grumble against each other. Um, that, that's not the kind of spirit that we want to have within the church, but um, also that was, a, in an extended view, that was don't grumble against God either, because we, we talked about that. To grumble against God is to question His His sovereignty on the one hand, but also does question whether he knows what he's doing or not. I mean, if you grumble against someone, you're grumbling about the position that you're in, the state that you're in, and usually if that person or being has something to do with the state you're in, well, you're grumbling against them uh, for being part of putting you in whatever suffering you're in. And so James strictly warns um, his readers against that. And, and, and that goes back to what we discussed as far as putting God to the test, because you are indeed testing him. You're, you're saying, God, if you're really God, then you wouldn't be doing this to me, so why don't you wake up and recognize how bad I'm suffering? That's not a, at all what James is talking about. And so he turns to the prophets, and, and he turns to the Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture, to find examples. And, and that's what we first see here in, um, uh, in verse 10. And, and we learned a valuable lesson, and, and I don't know if I emphasized it as much as I should as we were going through this, but we learned a lesson uh, of where our heroes should be, wh where the people we emulate should be. Now, first of all, we notice that examples in Scripture, some of them are good and some of them are bad. Some of them are examples to follow. Some of them are examples not to follow, and we run into that all the time. But they're, they're pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. It's not like you're, you're sort of lost about what your good examples are and what your bad examples are. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the, 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 the scriptures are, are magnificent uh, um, um, resources as far as setting our examples of how we're going to live, how we're going to deal with each other, our relationship with God. And the great thing about the way that Scripture deals with these, not just the prophets, now I'm talking about the patriarchs and, and other great figures, um, is, is that they don't whitewash them. They, they just they lay them out the way they are with all their warts and all their problems so that we can see them in a very honest way exactly as we are. Take someone like David. Now, David's not a, uh, well, he was a prophet, um, but he, he's not one of the major or minor prophets. But, um, you know, his life was not exactly one you would want to emulate in every aspect of his life. But then other parts of his life are hugely um, uh, uh, good examples for us to um, follow his love for the Lord, his compassion for worship, his um, uh, his humility when he he did wrong. There's so many things about David that we should emulate, but it's not like you've got this figure that is is an ivory tower that you could never achieve. The only ivory tower in that sense that we have is is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing about Jesus is that he offers us his righteousness. So it's, it's not like, yeah, he, he's completely unattainable in, in, in his life, the way that he lived, but he offers that righteousness to us as part of our um, redemption, part of our salvation. So, but, but nonetheless, I, I think it's, it's important that we, we turn to Scripture. Uh, and we did talk a little bit about who our heroes are. We'll get to that in, in a moment. But James focuses on the prophets of old, and he, 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 again, talking specifically about suffering and being patient in suffering. And the one thing about the prophets is that, in general, they were treated badly. And we read some examples of that, of, of how uh, they, 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 were, they were, you know, killed and murdered and, and sawn in two and, and, and all kinds of horrible things that would happen to them. So um, they, they are great examples of those 
who not only remained patient, but later on we're going to get into this word steadfastness. They remained steadfastness um, in, in, in that kind of suffering. And then we took some examples. We, we got, uh, you know, it says you turn to scriptures and have examples of the prophets, so we looked at some of those examples. And first from the Old Testament, we talked about Daniel, which, who was a great example of patience under suffering. We talked about Isaiah and Elijah and Jeremiah. We could have taken them just one by one, but those were the ones we focused on. And then we turned to the New Testament to, to look at New Testament apostles and prophets and messiahs. We saw Jesus and Peter and Paul and we could uh, John. We could have taken any of those apostles and they, again, are magnificent um, examples for us, both in what not to do and some of the things like, for instance, Peter sticking his foot in his mouth constantly, the me first, the me also fever, uh, 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 Peter. But, um, and then we looked at a couple of, of those who were not prophets, who were great examples. And one of those was Stephen the martyr, but the other was Job. And, and we're going to talk a lot about Job tonight, um, because for what James wants us to see, Job is a, 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 the example of, of steadfastness under suffering. And we'll get to the difference between steadfastness and patience um, in just a moment. And we sort of ended on a note of asking ourselves, and of course that was a, um, uh, that was a, a, a personal question, but we begin to sort of ask ourselves, well, who are our heroes? And, and I'm gonna ask you, if we get to the end of this tonight, I'm going to ask you to gauge your examples and heroes by those you spend the most time with. And I think that if you were to put the clock to the amount of time you spend with the prophets and the amount of time you spend with fake people on television, you'd be surprised at um, who you're actually spending your time with. But anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. Let's continue. Um, and let me see if I can get us down to where we are. I think we are on D, I'm sorry, E. Um, so if I can find it, then we'll begin to take a look at this. Yes. Okay. Question E under number one, as far as this study sheet is concerned, verse 10 ends with the statement that the prophets spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, why do you think James includes this? Why do you think he says the words, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord? How come he just didn't say prophets? Well, I think that there's two reasons, one obvious and not so, one not so obvious. The, the not so obvious one is the fact that these are the men through whom God spoke. These are the men who were persecuted specifically because they were true to the Word of God. They never wavered. They, they, they suffered for the divine revelation that was coming through them. And so um, that's one of the reasons he turns to the prophets when he's telling us, his readers, that you need to be steadfast, you need to be patient and endure under the kinds of persecutions that you're going through because the prophets were ones who actually did it uh, all through both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then so many of the martyrs of the church would fit into that same category. But also, I think that the reason he says specifically the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord is that, you know, to speak in the name of the Lord is to speak under the name or uh, under the influence, uh, literally to speak the words of God. Um, and there are a lot of people who were saying they were prophets, but were not speaking the word of the Lord. They, they were not revealing the true word. In, in other words, false prophets and false teachers. And, and, and so James is making a, a qualification here. He wants to make sure that, okay, if you're going to get an example, make sure it's a good one. Don't pick one of these false prophets. And brothers and sisters, the woods are full of false prophets right now. And it breaks my heart when I hear of people, you know, following after obvious uh, charlatans and obvious people who are just, just made up. Uh, there's nothing that they're saying that is actually the Word of God. Yet they suck 
thousands of people into, it's almost like they have some kind of spell that grabs people. I think greed has an awful lot to do with it, but nonetheless, there are, when, when we choose examples from among the prophets, let's go, let's go back to the Old Testament prophets and let's look at them. Let's uh, make sure that the prophets that we are fashioning ourselves after or that we are using examples, that these are indeed um, uh, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Well, um, the next question, did this preclude them in looking at the prophets of old that we are uh, going to use as examples? And again, we talked about Daniel, we talked about Isaiah, we talked about uh, Elijah, we talked about Jeremiah. Um, it, when, when you look at them, was the fact that they were prophets, did that preclude them from suffering? Well, the answer to that, and you know this, is absolutely not. In fact, in some instances, it was because they were prophets that they suffered. It's because, you know, when the Lord gives you a word and the people don't like it, chances are they're going to do to you like they did to Jeremiah, to throw you in a well, and you're up to, you know, your chest in mud, and, and to leave you there because people don't like to hear what God has to say. Uh, let me tell you, I know this from experience. If, if you're true to the Word of God and, and you tell people sometimes what the Word of God says and they don't like what they hear, boy, I tell you what, they, they get angry at you. And so it, it is the fact that they were prophets. And, and it's not just the fact that the devil targets prophets. He does. He, 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 he targets those who um, proclaim the Word of God. Um, um, but it, it, it is also, it is the Word of God that causes them to be in a position where they are being persecuted because, as I said, people don't like that. Um, now, just as, and just as an example of, of how the prophets of old were treated, um, notice what Jesus said in that great 23rd chapter of his, and you know, that's the chapter that he just unleashes and lets the scribes and Pharisees have it. Well, look there in the 29th verse and, and notice how Jesus says these Pharisees and scribes and uh, how, how they handled the prophets of old. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our father, we would have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. We would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. That is a scathing of... of uh, commentary on the way that uh, of their hypocrisy. Basically what Jesus is saying is, is you know, here I am. I, I am the Messiah of God. I am the prophet. Here are these disciples who are going to follow me in the church afterwards. I mean, if you look at Acts, they're in the same boat that Jesus was in. And, and you're trying to kill me, um, Jesus speaking. But you go and you decorate the tombs of the prophets. But wait a minute, it was your fathers who were acting exactly like you. You were the ones who caused that, that, those massacres sometimes. The, the blood is on your hands. And so he, he's giving a very scathing um, accusation of, of the people because of the way that they treated the prophets. So basically the example here is just that prophets were badly treated and severely persecuted. So to be a prophet was not necessarily a ticket for um, health and wealth and prosperity. Um, another one was is out of Acts, and this, as you may remember, um, is when Stephen is is being uh, just about to get stoned, and he says, "Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute?" And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. So. In other words, Stephen has fallen into the same boat, and you know what happened to Stephen. They stoned him right then and there. So, no, being a prophet will more than likely cause people to be um, persecuted and ostracized. Now, in modern day, 
Let's talk about modern day. Um, are there modern day prophets? I'm not going to get into that, uh, that conversation right now. But I can tell you that a prophet is one who said, Thus saith the Lord. And those who should be acting in the position of modern day prophets are preachers like me. I should be. I'm not a prophet. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't go out and say Pastor Kirby said he was a prophet. Um, but I, every Sunday, and now as I, am, as I am saying, by expositing Scripture, by trying to be true to Scripture, I am saying, thus saith the Lord. And quite often when I say, thus saith the Lord, it's extremely unpopular. P people are, 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 don't like necessarily all the time what the Lord says. And I believe that that is where persecution is, is going to really come about in our day. Is if you stand up and you say, thus saith the Lord, here says scripture, here scripture says that adultery and fornication and homosexuality and the, the new twist of gender, throwing gender back in God's faith, all of these things are sinful and an abomination to the Lord. You say, you say that, you're going to find that you have trouble. If I say that, I'm going to have trouble because that is something that infuriates people when they hear the Word of God. And of course you have all the guys that go in and twist the Word of God to, oh he didn't say that type of thing. But that's the reason the prophets are, are going to be great examples when, when and if we are under the kind of persecution that the people James is writing to are under. They're going to be the ones that we want to turn to to look at their patient endurance. So with that kind of on our minds, let's just ask the next question here. Will service to God preclude you from suffering? And I, I kind of just launched into that a little bit. Well, the answer, you know, is absolutely not. It will not preclude you from suffering. Um, much to the chagrin of most of modern Christendom, which says that it, all you have to do is, you know, follow Jesus and your whole life is going to work out great and everything's going to be wonderful. Well, that's actually not what the Bible says and it's not what Jesus says. And I, I gave you there, out of the Sermon on the Mount, um, the, the very last of the Beatitudes, Jesus says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, persecuted for what is right. Persecuted for simply stating the truth and, and saying, okay, this is what God says and this is the way it is. If you're persecuted for that, Jesus says, blessed are you. You're in a state of blessing. We'll talk about that word macarius in a minute. It goes on in, ver in verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Well, guess what? Jesus would not be saying that if that were not a part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. By, just by definition, we are going to be persecuted. In verse 12, he says, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad? Are you kidding me? That you're suffering and that we, we have all this thing going on? Well, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that the devil does, and I think I've mentioned this already. Um, I think one of, the th one of the great tools that he has is to steal our faith, our hope in the world that follows this one, in the life that follows this one. Um, he, he really wants you to think, just like he doesn't want people to know that Jesus is the Holy One of God, he doesn't want you to know that you're going to heaven, <laughs> that this life is a blink, and that you have paradise waiting for you. Um, and, and, and that's really where you want your treasure. And if you suffer, for the cause of Christ, if you suffer for righteousness sake, well, as he says in verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Your reward is great where it really matters. As the, so don't let the devil steal that. He tries, he does. He, he tries with me, he tries with, uh, with everybody. He tries to steal. Your, your, your hope, your, your, your knowledge, your, your faith, 
that um, this life is not all there is and that your reward is in heaven. It really does make a difference in the way that you operate, the way, the way that you live your life, if you know that that's where your recompense is and, and not in this world. Um, so the answer to the question, will, God, uh, will service to God preclude you from suffering? No, it will not. In fact, we'll go on down to verse 4, I mean to question 4. In fact, what is more likely to happen if you speak and live the truth of God's revelation like the prophets? Well, I think I've already kind of, uh, uh, kind of spelled that out. If you're true to God's word, you are going to be persecuted. And Jesus says it pretty clearly in his upper room discourse, John 15. Now, before in Matthew 23, this is speaking to the question, uh, are, are, were the prophets persecuted and are they therefore the good example for us to follow? Now, the, this is the answer to the question, will you, if you are a true follower of Christ, if you are a radical disciple, if you are following him, will you be persecuted? Well, Jesus made it clear, John 15, 18, if the world hates me, know that it hated me before it hated you. Um, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Brothers and sisters, that should be on the front door of every word of faith, prosperity theology, people who want to water down the word of God and jump into a relationship with the world to, to try and uh, their, their intentions might be good. But if, if, if you make an alliance with the world, then, and, and you know what John means by the world, the, the mass of unsaved humanity at enmity with God. You know, if you make yourself attractive to the world, guess what? You, you've just become unattractive to the kingdom. Uh, you can't have it both ways. So if you're going to stay true to the word, then, you know, right now our persecution, even though people talk an awful lot about persecution right now, our persecution is mild compared to these people and compared to many Christians around the world. Um, I don't think it's going to stay that way. And it will be very interesting to see what happens to the, the mega churches, the, the, these big churches that have really kind of Come, made, made a, a new way of of of, re, of, of a complying or a, almost being on the same wavelength as the world. I think we're already seeing it. I, I think we're already seeing the answer to that. I know the answer before I even ask the question. Um, and and that is a new religion is being born. Uh, and a new religion that looks like Christianity, talks like Christianity, claims to be Christianity, but has completely changed the gospel so much it is no longer Christianity. Sort of like a modern day revival of not not Roman Catholicism, but that that radical of a move away from Orthodox Christianity, uh, uh, away from the Reformation, when, when, when the superstitious, mystical, medieval Catholicism just became to where you couldn't even tell Christianity in the, in, in the basic principles. I think that's where, what we're going to see. We're, we might even see churches of that kind grow exponentially because the world is so pleased with the fact that, that they have become apostate. Um, but the true church, um, uh, the true church will never, never um, uh, uh, fall to that. They will remain faithful no matter how hard they are persecuted. Um, I, am I cheering you up tonight? Am I, am I making you, you know, kind of feel nice and relaxed and comfortable before you go to bed? Um, well, I'm just telling you what James is saying, okay? I, I'm, I'm, don't shoot the messenger. This, this, this is what James is making clear to us. So let's look at uh, number five here. So when this suffering inevitably comes, and I emphasize that the accent is inevitable, when the suffering inevitably comes, and, and again, I think that your suffering or your persecution will be directly proportionate to how closely you adhere to the Word of God, how closely you say in your own life, in your own actions, thus saith the Lord. This is why I, my, my, my faith and my hope is in Scripture. 
And so therefore I cannot move away from that. Uh, and, and that's the inevitable uh, nature of the persecution. So when this suffering inevitably comes, what, according to James, is your desired response? And this is the key now uh, of what we're getting at or what James is getting at, because what he has called upon his readers to do is to be patient in suffering exactly like the prophets of old were who were severely persecuted. So it's patient endurance that James is calling us to. A patient endurance, not taking up arms, not fighting against it, not uh, 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 forming political parties so that we can rise up above this and, 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 and uh, uh, change things that way but rather patient endurance turning to God entirely for all of our ex, uh, um, uh, all of our solutions not grumbling not uh, muttering under our breath uh, against God's sovereignty against his plans um, and especially maintaining our faith in God, in his wisdom, in his omniscience, in his eternal decree, his goodness, his compassion, his sovereignty, his omnipotence, everything we know about God, maintaining our faith, our faith in that God. And the one thing that we want to make sure we don't do is to shake our fist at God. And unfortunately, I know this happens so often. You go through suffering and ask God, how could you do this to me? How, how could you let me go through this? Um, when we turn to Job in just a moment, I think that you'll see that, um, uh, that that's exactly what the devil wanted Job to do and exactly what he didn't do. Well, let's look here at this last question on this verse. James is telling his readers to follow the example of the prophet, of the prophets and those like them. We tend to make examples of those we surround ourselves with or idolize. Would you say you spend more time with the prophets or with other less lofty examples. I told you I was going to ask you this question. It's a personal question. You can't respond to me right now, but you can ask yourself. You can pull out the mirror and look at yourself and say, okay, who do I spend most of my time with? Am I spending most of my time with the prophets? And let me just kind of equate that with scripture because that's where you're going to read about the prophets. So how much time are you spending with the heroes of scripture, uh, of, of, uh, of the ones that we've talked about, and how much time are you spending with celebrities, sports figures, um, um, the, 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 what, what happens when you idolize a celebrity? Just, 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 I mean, take any celebrity that you want today. And what happens when you spend your time with that celebrity? What happens to you when, when that's the person or that's the, the, the kind of, of people that you surround yourself with? What happens when you spend more time with today's sports figures, most of whom have political ideas, uh, um, uh, live totally egregious sinful lives and blatantly and openly, what happens when you surround yourself with that? And, and, and that's your input. Well, unfortunately, it rubs off on you. It, it does. And so therefore, James is saying, look, you know, you know, now granted, I know that I'm preaching to the choir to a degree because if you were spending more time with them, you wouldn't be here listening to me going through this uh, uh, kind of discussion. But nonetheless, I, I think that we all, to a degree, we don't recognize how much time we actually spend with other people um, who, who are really not good examples at all. And, and if anything that they have to say rubs off on you, well, that's not good. It's not a good example. So anyway, let's go on and um, begin to look at the 11th verse. In the 11th verse, James calls on the Old Testament example of Job as a model of steadfastness. Notice the word that is used, steadfastness. So let's read that um, verse. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. 
You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So he, he, he brings Job out as an example of steadfastness, and, and he says that those who remain steadfast are blessed. Okay, so let's look at some of the questions that come from that. Um, first of all, what does James want his readers to be steadfast under? Well, I think we pretty well established this going back to verse 10. Um, it, it specifically, he wants them to be steadfast as he, the words that were used there were patient, but steadfast under suffering. The, they, the whole discussion of the prophets and the way that they uh, underwent suffering and were patient, that's still on the table. And that's right exactly what should be in the back of our mind. So obviously, he wants his readers to remain steadfast under any kind of persecution or any kind of suffering, not just persecution. I probably have overemphasized that because quite often we suffer just from physical or financial or relational problems and, and it's not necessarily being persecuted. I know that James is talking to those who are being persecuted, but it, it, it's, it's really steadfastness under suffering that, that he is calling us to be, whether that is persecution or some other kind of suffering. Well. In, in this, going to the second one, he is echoing some of the words of Jesus. Now, can you remember what he said and when? Now, I'll give you a hint. It happened on a mountain when he said these words. And I'll give you even an easier hint. He said them at the very beginning of what he said on the mountain. I'll even give you an easier hint. It was a sermon and it had was given on a mountain and so it's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. And we know these as the Beatitudes um, and, and no, those aren't the be attitudes, meaning these are the attitudes that you are to be. Um, we'll talk about what <laughs> <laughs> what it actually means in a moment. But in, in the, again, in the 10th verse, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are you when people revile you. So he, 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 Jesus made it clear, and we read those verses, so I'm not going to read them again. But he made it clear, Jesus made it clear, that there was blessing to be found in those who were persecuted for righteousness. So, with that in mind, what does the word blessed mean? In the context that it is used in. Rereading this verse so that we can see the way that James is used it. Blessed or blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, regardless of what that trial is. For when he has stood the test, he will, I'm sorry, what's this back in the first chapter of the 12th verse? <laughs> Um, let me read that again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The underlying word in the Greek is one well worth knowing. It's makarios, it is, is um, the meaning of the word. It's the same word that Jesus used in what are known as the Beatitudes um, as he opens up the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and, and the word doesn't denote an action. In, in other words, it, it doesn't say that the person who has this kind of behavior, that the outcome of that behavior will be that he will be blessed. So in other words, what James is not saying here is that the person who is steadfast remain steadfast under persecution, that person will be blessed for that. There'll be a blessing that is involved with that kind of activity. Now, that may be true, but that's not what James is saying. It's not what the word makarios means. It means a state of blessedness. In other words, the one who is steadfast under suffering is in a state of blessedness. In other words, the steadfastness comes from the blessedness, not the blessing coming from the steadfastness. It, it, it's the reverse, okay? So, uh, and, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, is blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those, if you are poor in spirit, thank God for it. 
because you're blessed, because that's the favor of God. That's what it means to, to, to be in God's favor, to have God smile upon you, to be in a state of blessing or blessedness. Um, it, it is a gift. And now, the gift might come as a result of your faithfulness in other things, but the steadfastness that James is calling his people to. Now, how do I put this? Um, it, it's, it's almost that, it, like the, the Christian life it is a river, and, and it's flowing towards a destination. And you can't separate it out into rivulets of water and, and to, to say, okay, uh, I, I'm good here, but I'm not good there. And this has no impact on what's going on over here. The Christian life flows together. And so if there's a problem in one aspect of the life, then it's going to impact the rest. If there's diligence and faithfulness in one aspect of the life, well then it's going to bring reward or, or, or blessing in other parts of that life. Now I'm not going back on what I just said about Macarius. I'm not re reversing that. What I am saying is that quite often a state of steadfastness will come because someone has been faithful in other things. And, and it's a gift. It's something that God gives in that state because He is um, he's, he's smiling on that individual, okay? So it, it's like everything goes together in our Christian life. It, it's one thing impacts another. You can't, it's just like, I guess the best way for me to describe it is um, a, a man can't come up and, and say, I want to be a good father, but I hate my wife. <laughs> it doesn't work, sorry. You can't despise, you know, the, the marriage that God has put you in and treat your wife poorly and then end up being a good father. I've actually had people say that to me, by the way. Um, and, and, and end up being a good father, they go together. In order to be a good father, you're going to have to be a good husband and, and you're going to have to foster the family. So it's the same thing with Christianity. We are in a life sanctification and everything kind of works together. And that the more we turn towards God, the more our state of blessedness in the attributes of Christianity, um, the sanctification that we all desire, it, it, it is impacted by that. Now, that is not prosperity theology. That is not health and wealth. I'm not telling you, you be a good person and God is going to bless you. What I am saying is that that all flows together. And the more we pursue a godly life, the more we are spiritually blessed. This may not take physical blessing. You, you, you may be hit with all kinds of illnesses as a result, but there's a spiritual blessing that comes with it. That, and, and that's kind of the idea of the blessedness that James is talking about, a blessedness that comes through faithfulness. And that's the kind of steadfastness that he's looking for, a, a steadfastness that God provides. Uh, okay, I probably confused you with that, but, that, but it, it, it's not an easy um, uh, concept. Um, but let's go ahead, and you can you can ask me questions later on if you want to, if you want me to explain that any better. Um, but let's look at uh, in verses seven to ten. James talks of patience. That's just what we've come through—a discussion of patience, where James is calling us to be patient, enduring our suffering. But here in verse eleven, in particular, when he talks about Job. He uses the word steadfastness, okay? What, if any, is the difference in meaning between these two words? Well, some scholars just simply think that they're two words that mean the same thing, that, that there's no difference in them, uh, but there, there is, okay? And especially in the way that James used them. Um, he tends to use the word patient to mean to be patient with one another, especially in our relationships with each other. Um, just to give you a dictionary, a Greek dictionary trans, uh, uh, definition is to remain tranquil while waiting for something. In other words, have patience, wait, but to be tranquil, tranquil and steady and balance that. To bear up sometimes under provocation without complaint, um, to have 
forbearance um, regardless of the situation that you were placed in, especially with other people, to be patient of other people's shortcomings, to be patient of other people's personality quirks, to be patient of a of, of, of variety of things in relationships. Now, steadfastness is talked more about standing or holding up or remaining strong in the face of suffering. It's perseverance, if you will, in the face of suffering. The capacity, going back to the dictionary, the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty, endurance, fortitude, perseverance. And it's, it's, in, it's not just to endure grumbling or angry or to make it through. It's to endure with perseverance, with faith, uh, to, to stand firm even in the midst of your suffering. That's the way James uses steadfastness. So when he said, blessed are those who are remain steadfast both in the prophetic sense and in those who are um, using them as an as example, then that's a state of blessing to be that kind of person. And so he, he's going to t uh, put us in touch with Job as he does that. But why do you think James switches? I mean, here for 7, 8, 9, 10, um, at least, the three or four verses, he's been talking about patience. And all of a sudden here, he switches to speak of steadfastness. Well, like I said, a whole bunch of scholars don't put any effort, in, any emphasis on it at all. It's just James making the text more readable, more interesting, kind of richer, better rounded by using a variety of language. But actually, I think James does mean something different. And, and, and I think that he uses patience specifically to talk about problems with, with each other's and he uses steadfastness to specifically speak about the problems that people face through um, the trials that they face. And you remember that James has had an awful lot to say about trials. Okay, well, let's go on. Um, in the second sentence, James turns to Job as an example of the kind of steadfastness he's talking about. You have heard, and just to read that second uh, sentence again, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. So I have a question for you. Did Job ever complain to God about the way that he was treated? In other words, do when we talk about him being patient, does that mean that he never ever complained? And I, I've, I've given you a couple of verses there from the 13th chapter of Job, Job 13 and 4. Did Job ever complain? You can't read the book of Job without seeing him complain. He complains almost every page. Look at verse uh, 3 in, in chapter 13. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. As for you, he's talking to his friends, you whitewash with lies, worthless physicians are you all. Um, he's not too uh, happy with the way, and, and you remember the way James g occurs. His three friends come after his devastation. You know, he's just been totally devastated in, in, in both his finances and his family and his relationships. His wife tells him to curse God and die, you know, and, and then he's, he's afflicted physically. And his three friends come, there's four of them all together, but three come initially, and they've come so that they can comfort Job in his suffering. <laughs> but they take one look at poor Job, and they just, I mean, any ability for them to comfort Job just goes out the window. And, and they start trying to convince Job that no one suffers that badly unless they've done something horrible, unless God is punishing them. So they keep trying to convince Job that, you know, Job, you, you, you need to fess up, you know, because if you fess up, then chances are God's going to forgive you and you can go ahead and move through this. And Job just keeps saying, guess what? I didn't do anything. I, I, I mean, I did not do anything that would bring on this kind of suffering. So um, that's the reason he's telling his, uh, his friends that they're worthless physicians elsewhere. He says you're worth worthless counselors, worthless helpers, um, because they are. They're just making matters worse.
reinforced by their dogmatic stance on um, uh, why Job is being punished. Well, do you think that Job is a good example of patient endurance? Now, remember, that's what James was talking about up to the time that he begins to talk about Job's. So do you think that Job is the good example of patient endurance? Well, notice that James doesn't use the word patient endurance with Job. He switches to the word steadfastness. And so, no, I don't think Job is a good example. And, and I, I, I have to say that that was one of the hardest books uh, that I have taught. Um, it was one of the most difficult. First of all, it's ancient, um, and uh, the language is difficult. E even the underlying Hebrew is difficult, and sometimes there's all these places that just are very hard to, to interpret. But it was a difficult book just because of, 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 of staying with the nuance of what was happening to Job. And, and no, Job was not a patient man. And, and you know, that's what you've heard, the patience of Job. That person has the patience of Job. Well, actually, Job was not patient. If you really read it and you pay attention, he, he is actually impatient. Look in Job 16, the, the verses I've given you from there. Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall windy words have an end? In other words, you're just full of air, of hot air, or what provokes you that you answer? I also could speak as you do if you were in my place. I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. That doesn't sound like a patient man. He has lost patience with his friends. The 11th verse of the 6th chapter, what is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should be patient? Why should I be patient? Is there anything for me to be patient about? So where do we get this idea that Job had such great patience that, that we talk about the patience of Job? That's the reason that James uses the word steadfastness. Let's go to the next question. What then was Job truly? steadfast in. Well, he was steadfast in his faith and endurance of going through the suffering without losing his faith ultimately in God. In fact, if, if you were part of that study, you may remember that Job's greatest problem in the entire book was that he could not reconcile in his mind who was on the other end of the spear. In other words, causing his suffering and enjoying it. No, uh, I mean, obviously, maliciously enjoying his, his suffering and the fact that God was sovereign. He, he just couldn't come to grips with that in his mind. And that's what troubled him more than anything. But. He never actually crossed the line. Boy, did he get close to it. Uh, uh, as far as the way that he was sometimes arguing with God, sometimes complaining, but he remained steadfast nonetheless. And, and, and I've given some verses here. And my goodness, what happened to this hour? It's already 725. Uh, let's go ahead and read these and, 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 and we'll wrap it up. But Job says in the first chapter, uh, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Look what he says, even in the midst of his suffering. Now, of course, this is just the beginning of it, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In, in other words, no matter what happens, I, I came into this world with nothing, and I'm going out of this world with nothing. So if God gave everything to me, and he sees to take it away, well, blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, he's giving praise even in the midst of his suffering. And, and we also learn that Job did not sin. Look at the second chapter, the 10th verse. But he said to her, this of course is just after his wife says, oh, Job, just curse God and die. You know, just, just be done with it. Curse God and, and let's just get on with this. Um, she obviously didn't know how to deal with Job's suffering either. I'm sure it was suffering for her because she lost her family as well. 
well. But nonetheless, that was a totally uncalled for statement. And so Job responds, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Boy, that's an important phrase for us to understand Job. No matter what he says, no matter how close he gets, he doesn't sin. And this is all an example of steadfastness under trial. Um, we also learned that what he did not let slip and, and it, uh, boy, did he come close. He, he would walk right up to that line and then he would back down because he never, he never cursed God. He never lost faith. He struggled so much to try to understand what God was doing and why his punishment didn't match whatever crime he committed. And what bothered him more than anything was the, the, you know, the, the, the logical human logic, the logical conclusion is that, well, God can't be just if he's bringing a punishment on me that doesn't, that, that doesn't match the crime. Now, of course, we know because we read the first and second chapters that there's a different reason for that. We'll get that uh, later on. But let me read this beautiful uh, set of verses from the 19th chapter of John. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. So James, James is making a wonderful decision to turn our attention as an example towards Job. Because who among us has not done the same thing? The difference between Job is, is that quite often we do shake our fist at God. And, and he, he, he came up short of that. He never cursed God. He never lost faith. And he never said anything that led him to sin. Although he did have choice words for his friends and their kind of hypocritical, dogmatic stance. Okay, we're just going to pull the plug right there. It's already uh, 7.30, and I don't know where this hour went, but I guess that's a good thing. I hope it passed quickly for you, too. Um, but we'll pick it up right there. We'll kind of review uh, Job. We'll finish this up, and, and then we will launch into an excursus um, on that 12th verse, that kind of oddly placed, seeming like it's out of place, 12th verse which once again, almost word for word, not, well, not word for word, but certainly idea for idea reflects the teaching of Jesus. So that's one of the things we like about Job, so, I mean, James so much. Um, okay, let me leave it there. Uh, let me pray, and I will let you go, give you your evening back. So let's just thank the Lord for the beauty of, uh, of his revelation. Father, we thank you that you just didn't show us about our relationship with you and what kind of God you are and how we should serve you. You didn't just tell us how we would be saved and redeemed, but you tell us how to live as Christians. You tell us um, where to find our heroes, uh, what kind of examples we should be following. You, you give us clear-cut indications of what is good and evil. If, if we choose evil or if we do evil or if we are overcome by evil, it's not because we have not been told. It's not because you have not made yourself clear. And, and in fact, you, you, you give us foundational principles to follow. And if we will just follow those foundational principles, then the more complex ones just start to flow in the same river that is our sanctification. So we thank you for that, dear Lord. We give you praise, and, and we give you glory, and we give you honor as we wrap this uh, teaching up. Um, thank you that you continue to reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for me. Um, we'll pick it up there uh, next week. And um, I just pray that the Lord blesses you for the rest of this evening and that uh, you have a great week. So thank you for uh, tuning in and may the Lord bless you.